We have with us a longtime member of the Georgetown community, although recently departed to other pastures, but still <laughs> remains in our hearts. Uh, Saleh Sayil Ghan is a visiting professor of Islamic and Religious Studies at Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C. He also serves as the managing editor of the Journal of Interreligious Studies and Intercultural Theology. He received his MA in Religious Studies from the University of Alberta and a PhD in Religion and Culture from the Catholic University of America. His research concentrates on Islamic theology and practice, Quranic studies of Islam in America, and Christian Muslim relations. Prior to his appointment at Wes Wesley, he taught courses at Catholic University and Georgetown. He's the author of numerous articles and currently working on a book project concerning Islamic theology and practice. Now, was it only, were you a chaplain here at one point, or only your yes. wife? Both, yeah. You, so you're both chaplains in the residency, right? Correct. For, from 2010 to 2004. Yeah, so you have, you know, <laughs> I also lived in Georgetown dormitories, but so do you. We have that in common, and so do a lot of these students. Okay, so please, uh, we're very eager to hear about an Islam and Jihad, non-violent say, nor season model. Hello, everyone. Um, Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Brown, uh, for having me. And also, I would like to thank uh, Shireen and Andrew really, for making the process um, smooth. Uh, so I am delighted to be here. So um, why why this book? Um, I mean, it has been a decade that I live, um, almost a decade I live in the area, uh, you know, taught undergrad and grad courses in the area. And also, almost uh, every Sunday, I have an engagement with faith communities, basically going to, you know, Church communities, uh, adult forums, uh, especially when when the climate, you know, the political climate changed, people they were eager to more eager to you know to understand, to ask questions, to be informed about um, Islam with a good intention. But one thing um, that I would even the theme of my topic would be different. Uh, I more or less I would be, you receive the same questions, and and one of the common question would be uh, why Muslim societies are violent. You know, again, generic question. The other one is why there is no separation of the church and the state in, 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 in Muslim society. Why they struggle more uh, than, than the West. The other question is again uh, why, uh, especially in the religious pluralism context, why uh, there is less tolerance in, in Muslim society. Just these generic questions and of course, the implications usually would be the Middle East. Although, uh, you know, the Middle East uh, Muslim population would make less than 20% of the Muslim population. Uh, as you know, more than uh, one million of Muslims they live in Asia Pacific. But still, the focus and the concern is usually the Middle East. And sometimes, for example, I would be asked, you know, to talk about Islamic theology and spirituality, uh, and then you would expect. You know, so at the end of the talk, you would expect questions about, uh, you know, five daily prayers. You know, how Muslims they basically try to find meaning, purpose in life. But again, uh, even after a talk like this, my question would be the same, uh, basically, because people are so much conditioned with these questions. Uh, in a way, they are informed. You know, they come. Uh, you know, they are learned audience, and one of the most challenging things to how to unlearn what they already know. Um, so whether this is, uh, and I don't know, I mean, this will be a, a different topic. Where, where does this come from? Is it media or is it, you know, is it um, Orient study uh, of Orientalism? Uh, but somehow um, the question would be more or less, uh, more or less the same. And there are, there are, I mean, these, basically, these questions come with lots of baggage. You know, there are, there are assertions that attach to these questions. And one of them, uh, you know, when, uh, when, you see, when you receive the question why Islam is inherently violent, um, uh, basically, the, you know, then you, know, you see there is link to the Prophet's war, there is link to the expansion of Islam, there is link to, um, to contemporary, you know, modern uh, Muslim movements, right? Um, especially violent ones, you know, think of ISIS, Boko Haram, Al Qaeda. Um, the, other, the other assertion is that um, basically, when someone asks um, when, uh, why there is no the separation of the church and state, the assertion, uh, the assertion is that 
Um, in a way, Islam is a political ideology. So instead of recognizing Islam as a, you know, as a source of meaning, purpose, values for, for, for its adherents, so the assertion, the assumption is that um, it is a political ideology, uh, and therefore Muslim states fail to recognize the separation of the church and, um, and religion. You know, in this context, they always want more, um, more religion in politics. And as you know, this even comes to, into our politics, right? In American context, uh, you know, we had a discussion whether a Muslim can be a president or not. <clears throat> and the implication was that, well, uh, uh, Islam uh, seems more than a, uh, I mean, more than a religion, it looks like a political ideology. So there, there is, I mean, when, when someone raises this question, there is, there is a, a baggage attached to it. The other assertion is that um, Islam is, Islam is, um, unable to accommodate you know a secular environment when you know diversity or coexistence can you know be uh, a reality and so these are basically the assertions but when you look at uh, based on this question and assertions i just wanted to to bring you know the case of Said Nursi uh, you know from a modern context as an example to engage with these questions uh, and see if there is an answer. And also, I put, you know, in the last chapter of the book is basically to put Nursi, I put Nursi in conversation with Gandhi, Mandela, and, and Dr. King, and my conclusion is there is much in common. So unlike, the, again, the assumptions and whether is there, uh, you know, and, and the title, again, it is an Islamic, that Nursi is not basically an exception, but when you really go um, to the history of Islam, uh, it is, Basically, non-violent struggle for justice uh, is part of the fabric of Muslim societies, uh, including in modern times. And also, in terms of just to, to really understand um, Nursi, I, was, I would like us to think of Nursi um, as the C.S. Lewis of Muslims. Uh, so in modern context, uh, basically, uh, you know, facing lots of new challenges, um, he addresses the questions in the new context. So let me just briefly go over Nursi's context because you know it makes sense. Uh, his ideas and you know view of nonviolent jihad would only make sense if we know his context. In what context he addressed uh, particular questions. So Nursi was born in 1877 in the Kurdish region of the Ottoman Empire. He had his traditional Islamic education in the madrasas of the region, uh, so basically had the, you know, classical education. Uh, not not long after his, and then the context is important to know that, uh, you know, Sufism is the most important manifestation of Islamic tradition in, in his region. So basically, in, in, in mostly he works with Sufi Sheikh, uh, and not just in the eastern part, even you know, in the Ottoman Empire, Sufism. In a way, Islam is Islam means Sufism in the context because it is one of the most important, uh, I would say, institution in the context. So, but not long after his um, his education, madrasa education, uh, because of uh, his skills and abilities, he, he becomes a public figure in, in the in, in the region. Um, but also, when you look at the, the context of this time, it is a dramatic time for Muslim societies, right? Um, the, the, more, the Muslim world was in a physical and psychological decline in almost all aspects, right? Like militarily, culturally, economically, and socially. In early 20th century, almost the entire Muslim world is controlled by the European power. So this is the context that he writes in. As one historian put it, from this vantage point, it began to look like the Crusades were on again. Uh, and again, the situation of the Muslim societies. The state of the Ottoman Empire was not uh, different either, uh, because you know, the, the, the Ottoman Empire was also struggling with stagnation and decline. Uh, and uh, the Christian of Balkans right, they were inflamed with nationalistic feelings and seeking all kinds of means to dismember the empire and become independent. So within this context, the uh, you know Ottoman intellectuals naturally they they were seeking solution for the problems of the Muslim world, considering that they had you know you know one of the, the longest empire in the history, um, and then uh, you know a, a glorified history 
but at the same time, uh, now you have decline, you have colonization, uh, and then you know Muslim intellectuals they are seeking solutions. And one 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 position was basically a nationalistic approach to bring see if we can bring now given that religious minorities they are seeking their independence within the empire. See if we can uh, bring all the Turks under one umbrella to unite the Turks. Maybe they will save us, or uh, it, we will have less damage. So the the, the focus on you know uh, Turkish nationalism. The other approach was the West, you know, the Westernist approach. Um, in a way, to to basically, in order for us to progress uh, for the Muslim societies to to, to get them out of kind of the, the, the tragedy, the drama, what we can do, uh, let's go through what Christianity went through in, in, in Europe. So Christianity went through Reformation, uh, you know, they gave up, uh, the church was challenged, uh, you know, they got into vernacular languages, right? Uh, uh, how about if we do the same thing, perhaps we will, we will get out of our problems. And the, so this was the second approach. The third approach was the Islamist approach, those who believed that still Islam should be taken as a departure point when it comes to change and reformation. And Nursi is one of them, one of these intellect, intellectuals. He basically, in this context, he, he tried to see if we can save the empire or we can make the situation of Muslim societies better by focusing, um, you know, by, by taking Islam as our reference, as our departure point. Um, because uh, and one, for example, one of his arguments is that, uh, you know, against the Westerners, when they argued that Islam, Islam is the reason for our decline and stagnation, his answer was that, well, we see there are many cases in history where other societies were declining, where in, in dark ages, you know, Muslims, they were uh, thriving, they were in a good, good condition, good state, so we cannot basically take this as an argument, you know, that because what West went through in, in the context of religion, let's do the same thing. So Nursi basically rejects this approach. But he believed that there, there needs to be there is there needs to be some reformation, especially in education. One of his projects, basically, in order to reform the madrasa, uh, uh, the madrasas, was to see if he can establish a major university where more, both modern and religious sciences could um, be studied together. Uh, I mean, in the course of the Ottoman history, although initially you see uh, that kind of this science in a way merge, but later on in the course of time, uh, you see that more separation, more distance between religious and modern sciences. So in his context, Nursi tried to see if he can form a project where both sciences were fought together. All right, this is his third, uh, so he's in his, he is, uh, and then he involves in politics. Basically, works with the uh, state officials. Um, you know, work uh, support of the freedom movement. Basically, and then he, uh, in in this context, uh, supports constitu constitutionalism. Uh, basically, that uh, if uh, that there is there is nothing that contradicts the Islamic law if we go for constitutionalism. And one of his argument is that. Uh, he refers to um, the Quranic uh, verse that they, uh, you know, shura baynahum. So they conduct their affairs um, with consultation by mutual consultation. So he thinks that this is basically uh, we can draw on the teaching, this teaching of the Quran, to make a case for constitutionalism. So in order to convince basically the region, you know, he, he travels to different parts of the, uh, the empire, especially to the eastern region, the Kurdish uh, tribes. And then of course they raise questions, they have concern. One of the concerns that they raise, if, if we have constitutionalism, that Greeks and Armenians, they will have the same rights like us. So they say if we have constitutionalism, now we will be on the same boat. Uh, how can we make sense of this? So they raise this question. And Nursi's answer is interesting. This is this is 1911, so this is important to, to, to think. So basically, loss of tension with the minorities. Uh, Nursi's answer: Non-Muslims' freedom in the context of constitutionalism is that they will not be subject to injustice and oppression. <coughs> so there is also the teaching. This is also the teachings of Sharia. So the idea is that with constitutionalism, if if Armenians and the Greeks they are granted, you know. You know justice, right? 
that they will not be subject to oppression. There is nothing wrong with, with this uh, uh, when it comes to Sharia because Sharia is even concerned the protection of animals, right? And the protection of the, the creation and how how then Sharia would be indifferent to the rights of an uh, Armenian and, and Greek, right? Mm -hmm. So the, se the second I interesting question, and again, 1910s, uh, the, the, the leaders of the tribe, they raised the question that what, so with the constitution, we will have an Armenian government. Because now there will be, you know, you will have the, 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 the possibility, the opportunity for an Armenian to basically govern us. How can we tolerate this? How can we make sense of this based on uh, based on our religion or Islamic law? Uh, and Nursi's answer again, if people are fine to have an Armenian mechanic or watchmaker, they should also be fine with having an Armenian governor. Uh, in a constitutional state, people rule, a governor is not leader of them, but rather in their service. Uh, so again, you know, there is, you know, lots of tension in the context, and even today, uh, I don't know, last time, uh, I think we have, we don't have uh, any Muslim governor in the Western context. We, I know that the mayor of Calgary is a Muslim, but it was a major news, you know, to discuss that how uh, uh, Calgary in Canada. Uh, but it's interesting that now in the modern context, an Orthodox Muslim is basically uh, arguing that based on Islamic law, there is no problem to have a Armenian government in, in, in 1910s. But what happened, you know, Nusi's project failed. It didn't work because the empire collapsed, right? Uh, most of his, his basically, his dreams and projects was, was about to see if we can, you know, transform the, our society and save the empire. But, you know, nothing worked. And then from the ashes of uh, the empire, a new republic emerged, right? <coughs> modern Turkey. And basically, uh, the, the new republic, and again, this is not the occasion to really talk about the details about the process, how it came to be, um, as it is today. Uh, but the, the most, uh, I would say the three important pillars of the new republic was nationalism, secularism, and westernism. So remember we said that there were three approaches, uh, right? Uh, nationalism, uh, nationalist, you know, let's unite all Turks together. The Westerners, let's uh, take the, the Europe as an example, the way that they you know, transform religion, let's do the same thing with Islam, we will, we will progress. And the third one, taking Islam as our departure point and see if we can do better. Uh, but uh, the New Republic did not take, uh, uh, naturally did not take Islam as its reference point. Uh, in fact, tried to disconnect itself as much as it can. Uh, so in a way, Nusi, was disappointed with the, the, the results. You know, he was he was supportive of the independent movement, right? After after the war, uh, supported the, the new government. But when he saw their direction, that basically now um, <coughs> there is an attempt to, to change the fabric of the society in the context of religion completely, he was concerned because in the new context there was no room for the freedom of uh, religion. Uh, Islam and freedom of religion. So it becomes basically uh, Nursi's um, new mission mission to offer new resources, uh, especially spiritual resources in the new context. Because um, now it is not a natural, first it is not an organic process, you know, in Turkey. Turkey. In order to make this new state national, <coughs> secular, and Western reforms were enforced from top down. So basically, it is in a way it is a trauma, considering that religion is the most important aspect of the society. You know, you have in a way everything completely changed. As noted by a contemporary scholar, in contrast to the story of secularism in the United States or Europe, secularism was imposed by compulsion without popular consultation. Con consultation. And just to give you some examples, um, in 1924, the caliphate was abolished. So again, there is still, you know, it is still a, a vivid a concept, a picture in the cycle of some Muslims. Uh, all the religious orders, tariqat, were dismantled and their properties were confiscated. The strong, I mean, again, I mentioned that this is this was uh, tariqat or you know, Sufi orders were the strongest 
Islamic institutions in, in and again in a way Islam meant Sufism although with modernity the dynamics of Sufism in Muslim society is changing uh, but you know, this is, this is uh, part of Islamic history and also many Sufi lodges or Zaviyas were turned into museums the madrasas or Islamic seminaries were shut down and again an example today um, no one could imagine uh, in our American context the seminaries to be shut down by the government uh, I mean, this is basically what Muslims they went through in, 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 you know, in the modern context. This was the experience of secularism. And not to mention that, uh, so Islamic law, uh, so the religious endowments were signed by the new state. Again, waqf, uh, the endowments known as waqf today, uh, and again, I will say, doesn't have the influence, the impact that it had before this endowment. Uh, but again, it was one of the most important aspects of a civic society, waqf. Uh, but they were again confiscated. Uh, Islamic was, uh, law was replaced uh, by European law codes. A new dress code was enforced, the brimless hat, which is commonly regarded as a form of following the example of the Prophet, uh, was banned. In a way, wearing brimmed hat promoted as being modern and European. The other thing that needs to be mentioned in the context of uh, the New Republic, uh, you know, the, 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 the Arabic, uh, the Arabic script or the Quranic letters, they were changed into Latin. So in a way, um, if you think of a scholar, you know, well-versed in Arabic, well-versed in, in Persian, well-versed in Ottoman script, and now in the morning you get up basically in a way, you, you don't know the name, the, the, the name, you don't know how to write. And basically this is some major scholars that they had to go to the school. Uh, so in a way, it is, there are actually now, we have studies that some of the, the Sufi leaders, they committed suicide. Uh, you know, just uh, being enforced to dress in a certain way, but also, uh, you know, shaving their beard it was a trauma for, for many of them. The call to prayer as <coughs> was enforced to be done in Turkish, uh, and with this, within less than a decade, the Islamic landscape has completely changed. So this is, a, you know, within a very short time, right, 10 years, in a way, you know, the legacy of an empire in the context of religion is dismantled. Uh, and of the institution of the new state promoted the Western culture as much as they can through new schools and translation. And actually, the inter one of the interesting things uh, about kind of the, this period, in 1935, a German uh, woman uh, by name Vilo Ling uh, travels based basically throughout Turkey, near the Republic. And she wrote a book, uh, and the title of her book is very interesting because she goes and sees the, the change, transformation. Uh, the title is Allah Dethroned. Allah dethroned a journey through modern Turkey. So basically, in a way, God, God doesn't matter anymore. God is uh, not fully in, in, in the new context. So what is, um, so this is the context. And then what would be the reaction, right? Imagine, so imagine uh, you are a scholar, intellectual, very concerned with religious matters. What would you do? Uh, I mean, that could be different. Uh, uh, responses, you know, certainly you have resistance, you have disagreements, uh, you have uh, revolts, uh, right? But Nursi basically in this context, uh, when he sees it, when he sees that there is now a new challenge, a new context, a new challenge to, to faith, to religion, he changed, he changed the directions of his focus, which is to offer in the new context, to offer sources of spirituality uh, and meaning for the believers. This becomes his most important mission. And then because of the concern that he is a public figure, not long after that he is exiled from, ex exiled from the eastern part to the, to the southwestern part of Turkey, and then for the, mo uh, for, for the last 30 years of his life, he was either, either in prison or exiled. 30 years basically, in, in very disturbing conditions. What they, in, within this 30 years in exile and imprisonment, he was able to write actually his, uh, you know, his book, a major work, the Risale Nur, basically one, uh, 133 treatises. Uh, and sometimes even finding a paper would be a big issue in the context. Just finding a paper, because you were not. Publishing books were not allowed in this new context, right? And then sometimes he would write uh, 
part of his pieces on box matches. Uh, you know, what, whatever kind of uh, paper that he would or the uh, thing he would find, he would try to write and then disseminate it uh, to his um, students or followers. The other thing is, um, so in a way, write in the new context, uh, so writing out, right, writing and reading becomes, in a way, his new jihad. And there are actually lots of references in his work that reading you know, for spiritual matters in order to enhance your spirituality is your new form of jihad. Writing out because they copied his writings by hand, you know, manually, because you are not allowed to uh, use machines or uh, places to, you know, to to publish thousand treatises, but rather you have to write write them out by, by your hand and <coughs> distribute them. So in this context, and then they were able to do it, but in in a very difficult uh, situation because both he and his students they were in prison, and there is actually an interesting example. Um, one of his treatises on, on Ramadan, you know, the month of Ramadan. And when it comes to the, the, the theme of his writing, it's not when you look at, you know, at peace on, on Ramadan, uh, anyways, you can go to different directions. You know, it is fiqh, right? What, uh, if you do this, it will invalid your uh, fasting. If you don't this, you know, in between, so, right? When it comes to a, you know, a writing on Ramadan. But Nursi is more about, Basically, the reasoning, you know, the wisdom, how it is beneficial for your spirituality. So this is, in a way, he's more concerned with faith, iman, not uh, less concerned with fiqh, because he thinks that you know we have enough sources to deal with the fiqh. And then uh, his treatise on Ramadan. Basically, the title is on Ramadan. So when this treatise was uh, uh, confiscated on on the on the on the treatise, it says it belongs to Ramadan. So in Turkish, it means uh, literally it means this is a treatise on the, you know, on, the, on fasting on, fa on the month of Ramadan. But of course, the authorities they thought this is this is this is a treatise that belongs to someone whose name is Ramadan, mm -hmm. because as you know, you know the Ramadan the, as the month of Ramadan uh, fasting, but also Muslims they use it as a, you know as a personal name, right? We have many Ramadans around the world, and basically they gathered many people, uh, you know, in the city. By the, name, uh, by the name of Ramadan. Because the idea was that you, in the new state, in order to, to basically realize the, 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 the agenda of the new state, um, engaging with religions, matters, and spirituality was not permissible. And that's why not just him, his, his students, they were in prison. But again, although uh, uh, you know, there is so much drama, tragedy, um, you know, if we think what, what he and his students they went through, and also the context of Muslim societies, he makes positive action. I would say maybe this is the closest uh, term that is uh, to non-violent jihad or non-violence as the most important aspect of his teaching, that regardless of what we go through, uh, positive action is, is very important for us. So basically within this context, not just him, and he asked his students to see positive things. You know, within within these difficult conditions, can we can we uh, can we find some meaning? And again, of course, uh, he offers something that can work in the new context, in the new condition, condition, which is basically uh, reading and writing. Reading and writing becomes the the new because again, it is uh, with the new institution, uh, the new institutions also promote a scientific materialism aggressive secularism, positivism, this basically, and then you have, you know, the, the, the communist context, these were all, these were all new challenges. So Nursi's target was not the state, basically, the government. He thought that basically the issue is deeper than the state itself. Uh, that religion, in a way, faith is challenged, losing the ground, and we need to offer a new narrative. And in a way, in this context, I think his writing is also similar to, you know, Ch Ch Charles Taylor's, you know, the new age, basically the new secular age, mm. because this is one of the arguments of Charles Taylor as well. That, <coughs> uh, I mean, the idea is that, uh, you know, Charles Taylor in his book, he refers to, I think, in 15th century, it would, no, no one would imagine to have, let's say, a good number of people who wouldn't believe in God. And Lucy uses actually a similar analogy because he says, 
in the past, in the history of Islam, when there would be someone who wouldn't believe in God, they would take him, this person to, to, you know, it would be very, you know, one individual to, they would take the, this person to Sheikh, right? And the Sheikh would say something and think that this, you know, they, they would, the person would find his or her Hidayah again. So it was, these things were very minor. But today, it's not just uh, part of our Western society, but also Islamic society. I think one of the most recent study in Turkey was that uh, deism is on the rise. Basically, those who are you know less associated uh, with uh, more, I mean, the number of those young millennials who are who would associate themselves with deism instead uh, of theism are on the rise. So the idea, I mean, in a way, Nursi sees it as a, a global matter rather than kind of uh, Turkish government's issue or state's issue. And he he writes, uh, you know, extensively on on suffering. Uh, uh, I mean, in a way, if you think of the kind of emergence of Buddhism, you know, there are three scenes uh, when Buddha basically eventually gets his uh, nirvana. Uh, you know, the scene of you know a sick person, right, an aged person, a dead person, and we actually have uh, a good number of treatises, you know, on illness, sickness, on uh, aging, really, and then on on death. So it sees, and then in a way, how can a believer because he thinks that in the modern context there, there is so much pessimism because of the, the conditions and he's, with his treatises he tries to see if he can provide some <coughs> guidance for meaning even in this context, in the context of illness, in the context of death, and the context of um, uh, aging. And also, uh, you know, in, in the positive, uh, you know, in, when it comes to his positive action, um, he, he emphasizes basically not just you know the contemplation in the universe, but also the contemplation of the self. Uh, for example, um, you know emphasizing basically dealing with the nature of human being. Uh, this is again he writes extensively on the weakness of human beings. That basically sometimes in, weak, in their weakness, impotence, they can find power. Uh, so basically, once the human being they recognize their uh, their weakness. It is a good way to turn to God, the one who is powerful. He, he emphasizes, uh, you know, that human beings are dependent and in need, uh, and then um, compassion should be an important uh, trait of the believer, because and even for your oppressors. And in a way, so I mean, the last chapter I make connection between uh, Mandela and Lucy, for example. Uh, I think it is uh, so. It is shared in, in a few. Um, books on, on Mandela that when he left the prison, when he left the prison, and he says, uh, I thought if I don't forgive those uh, because of what they have done to me, I would never be never liberated. Only if I, if, only if I forgive them, then I won't be liberated from prison. Because if I don't forgive them, it will remain for me forever, you know, emotionally. And this is actually part of Nursi's um, story as well. So I mean, in spite of the, of the uh, kind of the turmoils, imprisonment, exile, uh, he, he forgives, he says, I forgive um, everyone. And also he asks his students to, to forgive because of what they went through. And the other thing, uh, what was our time? Yeah, but are you bored? And so one thing, just a few other things, and I will stop. Um, uh, jihad. Uh, basically, so he expands also um, on on physical jihad. Basically, in a way, new interpretation. Um, I mean, one thing Lucy acknowledges that. Like any other religious tradition, violence is part of Islam's history as well. But his point is that you know, violence is not an Islamic issue, but rather a human issue. That human beings, they can potentially be very destructive based on their context and, and their environment. And Islam is no exception, other religions are no exception either. However, um, he also believes that time has changed that you know physical jihad is not convenient anymore and it, I mean if your purpose of physical jihad is to serve Islam it will not bring any service to Islam 
So but he also tried to make a reasoning. And he believes that the, 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 this, this time of jihad <coughs> should be with words. So instead of jihad of sword, he, you know, he emphasizes jihad of the words. This is the best way to serve Islam. So he believed in the power of words rather than the power of sword. And one example I want to give you is uh, from, uh, you know, this is a verse from the Quran that usually comes uh, not just uh, in the writings of those who want to promote violence, you know, Muslims, but also non-Muslims who want to promote Islamophobia. Uh, basically, this is, a, this is a verse 9111, uh, basically uh, the chapter 9 of the Quran, verse 111. And then it says, the verse says, um, so in Allah is the one who 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 is So this is the verse. And again, uh, so just to, um, to read the translation, God has purchased the persons and possessions of the believers in return for the garden. They fight in God's way, they kill and are killed. So this is the verse, you know, again, considering the... Uh, I mean, if you take the, lit the, you know, the verse uh, in a literal sense, uh, you, may, okay, you, may, you may raise lots of questions. So what, no, how is, uh, how Nursi, I mean, it's not an exception with Nursi, I check, I mean, I check few commentaries. Uh, Al-Razi, you know, one of the most, I would say, influential <coughs> Quran exegetes from medieval time, just in line with his interpretation, he emphasizes the spiritual meaning of this verse, basically. He says, uh, I mean, in a way, uh, how do you uh, how do you sell your body uh, to to God? He thinks uh, prayer is a form of selling your body, basically. Fasting is a form of selling your body. I mean, he emphasizes the spiritual meaning, writing and reading, basically focusing on your spirituality, is a form of uh, jihad in the context of this verse. So this is just one example, and he also um, he also uh, deals with martyrdom, uh, as you know, still uh, martyrdom, you know, shaheed or shuhada is still uh, these are fresh concepts, uh, not just in you know Muslim society, but also in you know modern secular states, even you know modern Muslim states, they would, uh, secular Muslim states, they would call their um, fallen ones, fallen soldiers, as a shaheed. So although you know they would. They wouldn't get along with many aspects of religion, but they were comfortable to call, uh, you know, as a secular state, to call their soldiers as a shaheed or shuhada or martyr. So what Nursi does, uh, I mean, I checked, now we have an expert in hadith in the room. Um, he emphasizes two hadiths. Uh, one is from Al-Ghazali, you know, you see Al-Ghazali, Ajruni, and Suyuti, they, they mentioned their hadiths. So the hadith is, the ink of scholars will be equal to the blood of martyrs on the day of judgment. Uh, so for example, he emphasizes in a, in, a, in, a new con in, in a new context of his interpretation of martyrdom, shaheed, he emphasizes this, that basically, uh, you know, working for spiritual matters, you know, reading, writing, <coughs> is in a way, uh, to meet the teaching of this hadith. So being scholar, not in a sense of being a madrasa scholar, but basically uh, knowing enough to live your religion in a secular context is, is in a way to meet. So the ink of scholars will be equal to the blood of martyrs. Another hadith, anyone who, who follows my sunnah when my community is corrupted shall receive the re reward of 100 martyrs. Uh, so with the new context, Nursi emphasizes following the, the, prof, uh, the, pro, the example of the Prophet, his Sunnah, and then for this he emphasizes this Hadith, which seems, I mean, it is, uh, I didn't come across the major collection, but at least it is in Tabarani, but it's interesting that he emphasizes kind of a new direction. These are part of Islam, Islamic teaching, uh, not exemption to Nursi, but in a way he revives these teachings in the new context. And also in the context of um, jihad, I would like to emphasize some of the principles that he put forward uh, in, a, in the for modern context. One of them is um, the sacred, that emphasizing the sacred, the sacred nature of human beings, that everyone is sacred because everyone is the manifestation of God's attributes, God's names. So regardless of your religion, your race, 
then we need to acknowledge the dignity of every human being because they are the mirror of God's names. Uh, well, I mean, just uh, I mean, in line with the Quranic verse, where Qad karamna bani Adam. The other one is um, another Quranic verse that he emphasizes repeatedly in his uh, work, uh, that taziru wa ziratun wizra ukhra, no soul shall bear the burden of another soul. Uh, so in a way, uh, basically in the context of justice, uh, he gives um, an ex and uh, he, he, he makes an analogy of a ship or a boat. So imagine he says there are nine, uh, ten people on a ship, right? riding a ship and then nine of them are very criminals, you know, bad criminals, very dangerous for our society and one of them is innocent and his answer is that we cannot, I mean, we, you cannot sink this ship because there is one innocent person. So in a way considering, you know, you know innocent people who are facing violence uh, in the name of religion, in, with this analogy, Rusi doesn't, doesn't leave any room. Uh, for innocence to be harmed. Uh, and then he emphasizes, for example, jihad against ignorance, unbelief, conflict, and hatred. Instead of this, he promoted education, faith, unity, and compassion. And one last thing uh, that he, uh, he provides also a few guidelines. This is also a chapter in the book <coughs> for the modern believers. One thing uh, that the service to faith should be free. Uh, so this is an interesting, somehow he links, uh, I mean, in, in his context, there are lots of um, people in, 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 you know, in the New Republic that argues that basically uh, religion is used to promote yours as a means to promote yourself. You know, to promote yourself, to get something, you know, uh, to get positions. And he says, in order for Muslims basically to, to dismantle these blames, and the service to faith, to Iman, should be free. Uh, this is the one thing. So he even declined gifts, for example, the kind gift. He declined to, often declined to meet his students, to, to see him as kind of a hierarchical leader. So this is important. The other thing is, uh, I would say, is also controversial internally within the Muslim community, within, within his followers, avoiding the politics. Uh, he emphasizes, he uses basically, uh, he believes that it is dividing. So, Involving in politics in the name of religion, he thinks it is very dangerous. It is dividing, it doesn't do any service to, to faith. Not to, not to involve in politics, but do not involve in the politics in the name of religion. Because when you are part, when you are part of a party, uh, you will, uh, in a way, the other party, I mean, if, if your party represents religion, and if the, part, the other party is not religious, in a way they're against you. So basically your party is associated with the religion and it keeps away people from religion. So I mean there is more, but I will just uh, leave it here. This, but it is, there are lots of interpretation about this. And the other thing is non-hierarchy. Uh, basically, the interesting thing, remember I mentioned that Nursi uh, writes in the context of Sufism. I mean at least his formation was context of Sufism, you know, Naqshbandiya, Qadiriya, in the eastern part. So he benefits, I mean, he engaged a lot with the essence of Sufism, you know, his basic spirituality, writings, but he, he leaves aside the institutional Sufism. He is not part of, he thinks <coughs> time has changed and he thinks needs to be said. So he's, um, in a way, um, thinks that not, hierarchy will not do service to faith <coughs> in the new modern context. And the last thing is, uh, I will say today, what is the manifestation of Nusi's writing today? You know, there's of course the community. In practice, uh, I will say the gathering is called Dersane. So, uh, for example, uh, I did my dissertation on, on these gatherings. Uh, if you go to Istanbul for the, on a Saturday evening, there will be thousands of places. This is not an exaggeration. Thousands of places where people, they come together. And the only thing they do, they just read uh, Nusi's work. You know, as a form of uh, you know spiritual uh, treatise or spiritual work, and um, and anyone can you know there is usually no hierarchy in many cases. Although in the, uh, hi because hierarchy part of human nature, uh, you see kind of attempts of those who, who are more 
uh, at the front. This is also reality. Uh, but somehow the Der Sanes is, I would say today, the, the, the most visible manifestation of Mursi's work. I'll just give you two examples. Uh, one is, uh, this is for example, uh, you know, so many young people, uh, this is from Istanbul, they just, uh, every Saturday they get together and they, you know, they listen to the readings from the Salah. That's it. I mean, it is, uh, in a way, the structure is very unorthodox, not in the content. I would say content still, uh, you know, it is the, 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 you know, all of the orthodox of Islam is emphasized, but structure is very unorthodox. You know, just this scene is very unusual. It's not a madrasa, it's not a mosque. Uh, in most cases, they, they, are, they meet in the apartments, in the apartments gathered together, and it is intergenerational, but with gender segregation. And this is another example. And these are not unusual pictures. Uh, basically, uh, every Saturday people they get together, and then so the idea is that again, uh, with the new again, if you if you think of the story of secularism in, in the context of Turkey, it is painful. There is lots of tragedy. Uh, it is top down, right? It is enforced. But within the new context, uh, you know. Many good-hearted Muslims, they want to do something in a way. What can I do? This is, I will say, many, you know, many observant Muslims, they would carry this idea that what can I do in the new context? And this was what Nursi did to provide meaning and purpose in the new context. Thank you for your attention. first study, then next, then the returning graduate students, yes. Thank you. Thank you for your talking. Uh, and can you please introduce yourself? Uh, you I am Amir, I'm visiting a scholar here. Say it again. Amir, Amir, Amir Surya, I'm visiting a scholar here. Mm -hmm. I have two quick questions. Uh, as you know, we have a lot of Sufis in history in Islam. Mm -hmm. Why, I, I, I don't understand completely, why do you focus on, for example, the Thursdays, and the second question is that uh, I think that he wanted to revise something in jihad. Uh, what was his method? What was his way for, for example, change something in jihad? Uh, I mean, why I focus? I mean, this is you know, this is just one example. So why you know why I don't do Sufism? You know, it's another field, another area. Uh, you know, I mean, I wish I can do it, but I think this. A big field, um, uh, and then what, what is it? I think this is his. I mean, this is his method. So again, when we think of jihad, um, and again, in a way, we think of a very material method, right? Material method uh, to counter. Can we take over the government? Can we have a political party? I mean, this. I mean, I'm not saying that these are wrong things, but this can be different methods. But this is his method. This is really, if you ask his reading, his readers to look at this is gathering on a Saturday evening and reading his work is their jihad. This is their method. They think, uh, you can say, is it political, not political? I mean, we can argue that still eventually this is, this is their political <coughs> agenda behind, but you want to transform the society, but they believe this is how they can change the society. So thank you. So thank you very much for your talk. So unfortunately, I didn't read your book, but my question is this: You started with a, a debate on whether Islam, you know, is like a political ideology or just a way of life, you know, and then you picked up Said Nursi and you know told us his story. So in his example, it seems that he initially he had like this <coughs> political ideology in mind until the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Yeah. But then you have now Islam just as a kind of secular, like you know, way of life, just bringing meanings, like you know, you know, religious practices into people's everyday lives. So, but but this kind of looked like a pragmatical move because now under the secularist regime, you have no space, no political space, for, you know, to really pursue a political agenda. So, like, also this is a big question, you know, in the context of the Gulenists now, and others. You have to ask so this is just one question. So whether this this is a genuine is change in Nursi's like ideology or whether he thought this is now because Gulenists claimed you know this move was not like a real move it was just to hide you know to kind of becoming like you know not hypocritical but like you know because you, you couldn't do the other so you now follow this example and then 
But the idea is still was political, and you wanted to take over the political power, change the society, you know, turn it back to the old Ottoman times. So this is new jihad. Is this like genuine, or you know, you really now gave up? I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean first, yeah. I mean, first, uh, there are lots of these disagreements uh, about, you know, whether. Uh, I mean, this is. Um, was it basically? Was he just for for the new context? You know, let me. This is, you know, let's say, if you have a hierarchy leader, you know, they will jail you, right? They will they will not leave any room for you to move. So what I can do basically, you know, maybe it is easier to pass around my books than you know, instead of like the leadership. So this, I mean, you can be maybe just his was convenience. Um, but I think it is more than this. I think he's, he was aware of at least the implications. He was aware of that the issue is deeper than the context. The context, you know, when you say context, so there is no freedom of religion, you know, <coughs> the, the religious institutions they were dismantled. I think, in a way, uh, you know, he was aware of kind of the emergence of new ideologies in the society. You know, positivism, you know, life without God. Uh, just, uh, I think it is. But there is lots of disagreement, even even among his followers. To what extent, let's say today, I am in, I am imagining if if you have an Islamic Islamic government, uh, would they give up their methods? Uh, uh, but I think just to agree with you, there will be lots of disagreements. But I will say there will be a good number of them who say, no, actually, still we will go with this because now with with modern context, we still have isolation. We still have uh, individualism. We still have problems with community. How how do we bottom a community to have communal life? This is this is uh, even under an Islamic government, we will have these issues with modern context. So I would say some of the things will be still relevant, but there will be agreements. I mean, I imagine some of them will say, well, if the government let us, we can maybe from now on instead of at the apartments, let meet at the mosques. I don't know. It's I mean, I imagine some will say. That's a good idea. I mean, I, two figures follow up and then Professor Borg. I mean, I think it's interesting to, to remember, to think about that. I mean, other advocates of nonviolence like Gandhi or um, Mandela to a certain extent, right? I mean, there's all, there was also a strategic or tactical element in the, what, the, way, the way they, why they chose these techniques. I mean, so it's, um, it's not unusual for people that even we would look at today as sort of um, principled or ideologically committed pacifists, uh, their path to pacifism is, also, is often also one that comes through like a recognition that this is the most, or perhaps only the effective, only a realistic way to um, pursue their agenda or pursue their agenda. So that there will be, there should be agenda, right? Yeah. Like even pacifism, like, I think that should, I imagine they want if you will have an agenda. Yeah, I think in and out of what you were saying, uh, you've got methodology, answering the question of what kind of methodology. But uh, let me ask you to kind of crystallize it. It seems to me that there are a couple of models. Uh, the, what people call the Salafi model, not the militant thing, but the methodology of using the community of the prophet as a model and trying then to duplicate that, as opposed to the reformer who engages in each jihad. And that's an explicit methodology. If you were to define Norsi, would you define him more using the community of the prophet as a model or Ijtihad? A good question. I mean, I, I think I would say both. But if you want me to put him into a particular camp, I would say he's more clo close to Salafism. Really? I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of kind of emphasizing the legacy of the prophet, the sunnah, I mean, uh, I would say he's. There is there is elements of ishtihad in, in, at, at the way interpretation. But I mean these are part of he, he draws on the you know, prophetic examples still. And there are, I think there are elements of ishtihad. But I think he's he's close to Salafism in terms of you know the emphasis on kind of the first generation of the prophet, legacy or even he says that he has actually a treatise on ishtihad, he says the gate of ishtihad is closed. Mm -hmm. So in a way he, he, in this sense he's very orthodox. Uh, it's challenging. I know it's just difficult to put uh, in the camp. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Hi, I'm Ingrid, uh, a friend of Sally's, but actually I've never asked you this question. Um, 
So in modern Turkey today, this this looks like a potentially dangerous gathering to someone who's at the top of the government. Um, is this being suppressed in any way? And then my second question is, why do men and women, why do it separate always? Too difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, in terms of this kind of gatherings, uh, I mean, it seems they don't have problem now. I mean, my understanding, they still do their gatherings, they are fine because their concern is basically spirituality. So the government doesn't see them as a threat in this context. Uh, maybe, I don't know if you want to discuss, if you worth mentioning, like, the relationship with Gulen is like the better. Well, what, I don't know how you call what the correct term is. And the Gulenist versus, like, what these, are these Gulenist groups? Or are I mean, one thing, uh, and again, initially, um, uh, I would say in terms of their work, their methodology, they are completely two separate. Uh, so I would say that this is a community, the other is a movement. The Gulen, I would say this is a Gulen movement rather than community. So it is organized, this is extremely hierarchical, uh, so you have these things, uh, but also why why there is you know you know some people they might make connections and links because uh, you know because of the influence of Lucy's writings you know in his preachings Milan also drew, drew on his writings and what well. so this is the connection and then also the whole, lots of overlap. So these are non Fetchala Gulen following yeah. nor Sea followers. Correct. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. They are pro-government mostly. Yeah. <laughs> mostly pro-government. And then there is uh, so the other question. So the was one is to this. Uh, why do the women and why okay. is no co-ed even among the young people no co-ed? Um, um, I know what is the. I mean, one thing. This is uh, I would say, in a way, almost a consensus of. Orthodox Islam, when it comes to spiritual gatherings, I mean, you have exceptions. Uh, so, you know, if it is a conference set up, you will see mixed gatherings. But when it comes to spiritual gatherings, again, especially in Muslim countries, whether this be Sufism, you know, Sufi gatherings, whether this be spiritual gatherings like Nursi, uh, it has, I mean, you see this kind of part of the consensus is to have kind of gen gender, I would say gender, um, separate, se segregated uh, uh, gatherings. And why why it is this? I mean, uh, I mean, there is a cultural aspect, but also I would say many Muslims believe that it is part of the legacy of the Prophet. This is how it came to be. And we, if we want to meet the, the, his example, this is how we should do. But there are, you know, there are discussions, especially in our American context. What does Zainab say about this? about the segre gender segregation. Zainab, his wife, is as much an expert on nursing as Salah is. I mean, somehow, I mean, the, the con I mean, first, this is how Nursi started. So again, uh, basically from the beginning, this is how the community was emerged. Uh, I mean, one thing kind of the, the, the the fabric of Turkish society, right? I mean, to, to some extent, there is a room for the mobility of women. So there is this dynamics, uh, but also just from the beginning, this is, uh, and again, uh, regardless of putting Nursi you know, as someone you know, who's doing Ishtahat with the wise tradition, but still he's very loyal to the Orthodox Islam, and I think this is, this is part of it. And historical, within the historical Correct. community, and em emphasis on community. Correct. Yes. And the women, they have their gatherings too. Same way. I mean, in a way, you can argue, let's say if you have both women, let's say hundreds of women, hundreds of men, with, with a man preaching, I mean, imagine, so this is what we would like. But in other case, now you have hundreds of women with a woman is preaching. Uh, so then, I mean, it doesn't seem very bad, at least, if you have a woman speaking. Dr. <laughs> Saleh. Are you suggesting, or not, or what are you suggesting? 
is Norsi producing a new definition of jihad? Is he reintroducing the same definition in the social political context of Turkey? I, I, I heard you saying he's introducing a new concept of jihad. And if that's the case, then I would have I will to say re debate it. I, think I remember you said that he basically he draws on you know, prophetic examples, right? He draws on the Hadith, he draws on the Quran, he draws on commentaries, right? He draws on Ghazali's and Ghazali's work. In a way, I think the better term would be Al Ghazali's work. So reintroducing it in the social political context of Turkey. Uh, I would say not just so maybe the uh, conditions of the global Muslim world oh. community, especially when it comes to ideologies. I would say not kind of more state and government, but rather I think reintroducing would be a better. Term. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There is another uh, lady. Hi, I'm Judah from the Conflict Resolution Program. Can you be louder? Um, sorry? Can you be louder? Yes, uh, my name is Judah from the Conflict Resolution Program. Mm -hmm. um, I have two questions. The first is, would you consider the Islamic Jihad of nonviolence to be a component of Sufism or to assimilate to Sufism with their nonviolent strategy? And then the second one is, how would you see Sayyid Nursi's uh, vision of women in the Quran in early Islam? Because that's highly contested where some people say, no, there was a lot of discrimination against women during the pious forebears, but then others say, no, they were actually very empowered. Um, they played key positions in, in local politics. They fought as warriors mm -hmm. in the name of the prophet. They, uh, Aisha fought, fought the battle of the camel, which was a very big woman environment thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious how you think he viewed that. Can you, I mean, can you repeat this first question again? Sorry. Yeah, uh, if you think that the Islamic Jihad of nonviolence is a component or could assimilate to Sufism, which is the mm -hmm. So I mean, one thing, uh, remember, so yes, he, uh, I mean, I think he's, he doesn't reduce Islam to Sufism. I think that let's be clear. So he draws, again, he's very much influenced by Sufism, but he's not a Sufi sheikh, a Sufi leader. He didn't, in a way, you know, it is, he thinks that it is not a tariqah. Many, you know, some would argue, some scholars would argue that he, did not really establish a tariqah maybe because of the context of this time, because tariqahs, they were dismantled, right? Um, I mean, at, at least from his writings, we can say that yes, he draws a lot on the essence of Sufism, but not necessarily he is a Sufi himself. But also, can we argue, and again, in the history of Islamic, I mean, if we want to associate nonviolence, with one aspect of, uh, particular aspects of Islam, would we associate with Sufism? I don't know, it, is, it will be a good question. You know, we, have, we have many Sufi tariqahs who were part of resistance, right, in the history of Islam. I mean, I know today, we, I mean, there is the idea of to, to promote Sufism in a way, you know, the pacifist, uh, the most friendly, peaceful aspects of Islam, but, uh, and again, the, the dynamics of tariqahs is really different. Sometimes like they're very political, uh, they are part of wars, they are part of resistance, they were part of colonial res resistance, right? Um, so this is one thing, in general, I know that I didn't completely answer your question, but at least uh, Nursi seems to draw loss on Sufism, but doesn't think that what he says is really, what he says is because of Sufism. He thinks it's because of part of the teachings of Islam in general. Um, so he doesn't want to reduce us to Sufism. The, the second one, your question uh, about women, to some extent. Uh, I mean, one thing from the beginning, uh, so women, they were involved, you know, in, in a way you can say, if you think of his mission was related to trans, you know, to, to, to be able to provide resources, spiritual resources for the community in a new context when they didn't have, right, opportunity, women were involved equally, almost equally in the process. But why do you think, uh, if you think of, uh, does Nusi think, um, is he a feminist? He is not. Is he, I will say he is very much still close to the orthodox approach of women. And you may ask, what does that mean? Uh, is question? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, you have a great question. Yes. Thank you. Uh, a couple questions. One on this idea of whether his conception is tactical or more reformist. Um, when he, in his writings, does he argue at all, or does he present his arguments towards certain groups of people, like 
is he discussing particularly let's say people who fought in the Sheikh Saleh revolt or those who actually fought the government or is he telling his followers don't try to fight the government because of the violence that has happened because he himself he served on the Russian front so he did at least in the past believe in a quote unquote traditional conception of jihad certainly at one point I mean traditional when you say I mean, this is a war content right there is mm -hmm. a, I mean yes I mean he he was he was part of the World War One, right? Mm -hmm. He was a, you know, uh, so this is one thing. I mean, we, the, the, he refers like there are writings uh, about you know if you are familiar with the history of Turkey, the Sheikh Said revolt, right? In the new context, you know there are different speculations about why it happened. And let's say it happened because of the revolution. Mm -hmm. Imagine. So Nursi actually disagrees. This is basically if you in in the I mean today I think when we think of jihad, I think it's important to know that. Those who are the victims of jihad, overwhelming majority of them are Muslims themselves. Uh, so Nursi sees if they, and then in this context, he writes that basically, if let's say there is a group within Turkey rising against the government, so who will fight against them? He's saying his followers should fight them. No, no. Let's say if there is a let's say there the is army. a group within Turkey, the, army, huh? the army. Who is the army? He says this is. They're Muslims, your brothers yeah. and you know, you, you, your, your friends. So he doesn't define it even if they are a secularist military government, Kemalist military government, he doesn't care. They're still... Yes, Muslim. he says that basically rising because even, you know, yes, the, the government is secular, people are Muslim. So he think basically still even uh, the victims will be Muslims. It will not solve anything. Mm -hmm. There should be something that will not be, that will not cost us very uh, classical Sunni approach. Yeah. I know. I think there was a one back and yes. Yes. Hmm? Can I tell us your name? Yes. Uh, I'm Sam and uh, my question pertains to what you discussed at the beginning in terms of uh, the political and sort of geographic context of uh, Saint Mercy and mm -hmm. I'm wondering when he created this idea of a more reformist sort of Sufism, was he considering this primarily for the Ottoman Empire and for Turkey? Or was he thinking about this for any believing Muslim or any believing Sufism? I mean at least we know that Nursi um, um, you know, for example he lived in the gov you know, in, in the governor's uh, how do you say it? House mansion. Uh, mansion, thank you. For for a while. So he was basically, you know, people they get the discussion, the problem within the Muslim world, society. Uh, he's not just you know he's traveling within the empire, you know, he, he has basically his famous Damascus sermon. So he knows basically the problems of the empire very well. And then is it again it is I think during the, his first period He's just addressing the questions of you know, the, the Muslim society, the Muslim societies in the Ottoman Empire, but also just how to save the empire, because he thinks that basically the survival of Muslims are linked to the empire. But the empire collapsed. And this is, yes, this is. Thank you very much. Benjamin Tour, retired bureaucrat. Uh, uh, I'd like to pursue further the lady's question about the empowerment of women in the Quran, uh, which is clearly a fact. Uh, you know that they are empowered in the Quran, it's a fact? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, people talk, I mean, in terms of divorce, people talk today about the ability of a Muslim man to divorce a wife very quickly and so on, uh, but the women also had rights of divorce. Mm -hmm. They could divorce themselves from husbands, mm -hmm. and they had rights after divorce, even if the husband was the one who mm -hmm. initiated the divorce, and so on. And there are many other ways. Uh, so my question is, uh, you said that uh, Nursi takes an orthodox view of women's rights. Could you be a little bit more specific? One example, yeah. Good, good. I mean, for example, he advocates headscarf. He thinks this is, he, you know, he provide me, he has a treatise, I mean, and one of the reasons that he basically was in prison is was because of his treatise on headscarf. He thinks that basically in our society it's good for women. For well, is that just empowering? I mean, um, I don't know. I think what, what do you understand from the part? I think Muslims, they have different things. I mean, you know, we personally, we may, I mean, we may have lots of disagreements, but I think 
I mean, at least, what, when, what, what do we mean when we say empowering women? I think, well, I think right it's under the, uh, the uh, canon law, shall we call it, for lack of a better term, of Islam. Divorce uh, within the family in relation to the husband. I mean, I can say just this. Um, I mean, one thing I think there would be disagreements when we say uh, let's empower women. Uh, what do we mean? And I am almost certain that Muslims they will have different approaches. I mean, if we if, in, if we all understanding in the West, right? This is one thing. But I also want to say that um, there is no doubt that Islam came as a reform, right? Empowered women in this context. But if we, there is also the reality of women in some part of the Muslim world, and I would say that in some contexts, just the culture that Islam, you know, the culture dominates the, the teaching of Islam. And where does Nursi stand in that spectrum? Yeah, I'm it's interested what he's mm -hmm. saying and writing about I mean, this. I thought, for example, uh, so you can, it depends. I mean, I, I, I he remains single. So huh? he remains single. Yes, he was sixteen. Yes, by um, by force. I mean, was he sort of in like a way, in prison was, all the yes, time? Yes, exactly. In a way, yes. So why does Nursi? Um, I mean, uh, this is basically will be a huge lecture because first, what I mean, his author and what do we mean by orthodox approach of women? Uh, I think he's, if it helps, his traditional. I think, I, mean, I think I get the sense that like the, the book is Islamic J Jihad and Nonviolence. We need another talk, another book on Sayyid Norsi on gender issues or something. It can come back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one last question. Yes. Yes. We some, yes. I saw a ha hand over there somewhere. Yes. Hi. Uh, I have an involved question, but it may not be completely relevant. So, did uh, Norsi write? Theological, philosophical treatises on like the nature of God, like God's unity, simplicity, so on and so forth, and and then there's a follow-up question to that. Yes. If he did, mm -hmm. um, you could say that what he was doing was, you know, using reason to uncover the nature of God, and from there, could you make the argument that he was kind of fulfilling, in the sense Avicenna would say it, is like man's final end by. Manifesting the final cause by instantiating the nature of God in Himself. So I mean, I mean, he. Um, so I tried to see where, the, how to locate. Um, uh, I mean, in a way, he's. So it is not completely philosophical. So he, I would say, the overwhelming majority of his writing is uh, is on. On theological issues, you know, major, the, uh, major, major, uh, uh, major treatise on is, is there God? Okay. Did, because these are these were these questions were raised in his context. Is there God? He so engages, and what 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 are the manifestations of God? How do we? What is the epistemological? Uh, how do you say methodology to find you know to, to to know about God? So just not to to believe that there is God, but who is God? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, he expands you know, on the Quran, on the nature, on human beings. Uh, human beings. Uh, he has a, one treatise on angels. Oh, okay. He has one treatise on you know the measuring of the predestination. He has one treatise on uh, uh, on basically fasting, but in a different way. Not you know in a way you think this is a theology rather than fuck. Same thing with with uh, five daily prayers. So basically. Uh, Dealing with the questions of the believers in the new context, because the new in the new context, the new state promoted positivism, scientific materialism. And in a way, people they were in desperate situation to to find answer for their questions, because not everyone was highly educated. And then they would get basically, you go to these gatherings, they discuss whether there is God or not. Yeah. I mean, it seems silly, but I mean, in in a way, this is the dominant narrative in our educational system. Uh, Did you say he was an Arabi fan or not? He he draws on uh, on uh, Ibn Arabi. Uh, yes, I think in a way he uh, he's close to Ibn Arabi than Fakhrattin Arabi. Yeah, so uh, probably Hike. My guess is that uh, one way or the other, he's doing what you're saying, because that would be. I mean, that was sort of what the whole post 
post Avicennan, the philosophical, theosophical Sufi tradition was sort of engaged in that uh, process through mystical or yeah. rational ruminations. And if he's an heir to that and participating in it, then it was somewhere in his way he was doing his, it. His word, his book, The Words, mm -hmm. it's all about the identity of God and how do we define God exactly. and how do we understand the whole book. Exactly. It, 300 pages is yeah. on that. And he thinks this is his jihad. Yeah. So would he, would he condone someone going off, like living by themselves for 30 years, just reading and writing about God? No community involvement. No, he thinks, no, he thinks community, so this is interesting. He's basically one of the major aspects of uh, uh, his writings and his teaching, but basically the believer should have a communal life. Hmm. Because the, 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 in a way the challenge to faith is collective and you need a collective response. But it's like Hayek is trying to option movie rights here or something. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like into the wild figure. Into yeah. Figure. Um, yeah, well, last question was. Uh, Moise Muhammad, is there any um, writings or communication between Muhammad Zahid al Gothari and Mercy and how they each other's views? Good question. Uh, not that I know, but um, one thing that it seems that there is uh, uh, there is lots of correspondence between Rusi and major shiuks of his time that in, in a very positive way. And then I know that there are many many tarikas who basically read Rusi's work. They they encourage their followers to work. So there is it's like it's very interesting. It's not completely Sufism tarika, but it's not completely off tarika and Sufism. I don't think it makes sense. Tough question. Um, well, thank you very much. Thank you.